Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. So I'm very excited about this next guest. Now, folks, you need to understand, when I first started this whole project, I had about eight or 10 names up here that I wanted to talk to, at least talk to them, get them on my program. And, 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 and then I got them, everybody, every single person I wanted to talk to, I've been able to, and you've been like the last person that I've been able to reach out to because you're building a house, dude. And you're also moving out of your house. Folks, I want to introduce you. Yeah. My audience knows who you are. I've got a lot of people who are big fans of yours. And just so you know, folks, I'm a, I'm a fanboy of Rod Meldrum, a firm, <laughs> firm foundation. Welcome to the program. Welcome. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate your, uh, your, your having this, have me on here and to be able to share some, uh, some information. Yeah. So <laughs> a little, little bit of a story. It is a, definitely a story. It's a very <laughs> fascinating story. So, uh, you know, I'm... Uh, just so you know, folks, you know, part of the reason I had um, Rod's coming on specifically, it, it, despite the fact he's very, very busy, but I invited him to come on to my program once uh, I saw that John DeLynn was having some Simon Southerton on to do a breakdown of Rod Meldrum's Heartland model. That's what they called it. And I said, you know, he needs to come on. Well, it was so, so cool because actually when I saw that they were going to be pre premiering it, Rod reached out to me and said, when is this program going to come on? And I said, it's be coming on later on in the day. And uh, I had uh, John DeLynn and Rod Meldrum's numbers in my phone. And I tell people I'm probably about the only person on the planet has both their numbers in their phone. <laughs> <laughs> and so later yeah, on, <laughs> that, yeah, it's crazy, dude. So later, <laughs> later that day, John DeLynn and Rod Meldrum are talking on the phone. And that's what this channel is trying to do. First time we've talked, actually, yeah. Yeah, and how did it go, by the way? How did the conversation go, generally? Very cordial, very nice, you know. And uh, no, no, uh, no, no big, no big, you know, uh, things. But we just you know, had an opportunity to just share a little bit of you know some of my uh, my thoughts about some things, and and you know, and uh, was able to watch the uh, the interview that he did there. So it was good. Well. Since you brought it up, we uh, just tell you real quick, you know, Rod Meldrum, Firm Foundation, coming on the program. Uh, Rod, just let's just start with that interview. Tell me what how you thought it went, uh, if you thought you were treated fairly, and also any developments that came as a result of that interview with Simon Southerton. Yeah, well, basically, so the, uh, the interview with Simon Southerton, uh, I've, I've actually had uh, several different uh, email exchanges and so forth uh, with, with Simon in the past and uh and you know of course he has uh you know taken some issue with our dna with my initial dna research involving that and and um i think that overall i think he was uh fairly um you know you know trying trying to articulate his his uh, thoughts and feelings and so forth and of course uh with john um both of them are uh i think in in the uh, in the overall camp but you know the science has uh, has a lot of the answers and and uh and so we have uh <clears throat> we we have you know if we if we go to mainstream science some of these things don't seem to be working out but uh but then we have to go back to you know some of the origins of the science and, and things like that but let me let me just kind of to uh to, to start off with here so uh so with with simon um, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, he was a, a plant geneticist. Now, a couple of quick things, just so you know, Stephen and, and, and my audience, and that is that uh, I'm not a geneticist. Um, I don't play one on any shows, <laughs> anything like that. And so, so I have really no authority to say uh, you know, what I say is, is somehow important or, uh, or, or um, authoritative in any way, <clears throat> which is why I basically have to go to sources and the sources that i try to use um when it comes down to you know the the gospel basically is you know the scriptures and prophets and so forth but when it comes down to the science you know the sources are peer-reviewed journals and uh so that's one of the things that uh that um i know that that you know that, that uh, both uh, simon southerton as well as uh, john delin were talking about and, uh, and the primary um focus was on the uh, the haplogroup x dna type and those who've been kind of following that for the last number of years know that uh, that there's 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 a, an interesting correlation there, and um, and uh, when it comes down to it, there's only five founding haplogroups or or uh, or overall groups in the Americas, 
that uh, that have been accepted as as founding groups. And uh, and it's interesting because four of those are Asiatic groups, and one of those is a uh, is a Caucasian or a uh, a group that that uh, the the origins of that uh, DNA type um, come from the, the hills of Galilee in Israel that has been found uh, all throughout the world. So <clears throat> maybe it'd be a, a good idea. Um, rather than addressing, I'll, 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 just, I'll, I'll just address that for really quickly. So that uh, the interview, there are the, uh, the, a couple of things that are, are important to understand. And that is that um, when it comes down to these, these, um, this DNA information, we, we fully understand and accept the fact that, that uh, we don't have a, a DNA sample from Lehigh, <laughs> you know, from, from, uh, from, you know, Soraya or, or, you know, or any, anybody from the Book of Mormon. So we have to kind of make some generalizations. But what we do know is that uh, Lehi was not, you know, because of the Book of Mormon, we know that he was a descendant down through the Hebrew lineage, basically. Um, he is not an Asiatic person. He is not a uh, African. Um, you know, he's, he's a, uh, he is a, uh, a Hebrew. And Hebrews are through the lineage of Shem, which is a, a, a Caucasian line, if you will. And the, so long story short is that, that we, at least that we should be able to, to determine. Um, any any uh, exact um, understanding of, of the DNA would have to come from if we had an, an actual sample and then compare that. So what we're doing is we're talking about basically comparatives. We're talking about, you know, is this, is this possible? Is it probable or is it impossible? And, uh, and when it comes down to the, the, book, the Book of Mormon and the, uh, the Heartland research, my, my book that I wrote, uh, it's called the Re Rediscovering the Book of Mormon Remnant Through DNA. I talk about that in some detail in the book um, about uh, is this something that's impossible? In other words, if the Book of Mormon, if it's, if it's a true history then, uh, of, of real people and places and events, then you would expect to find some, some level of, of, uh, of, of uh, evidence for that, you know, from you know, from uh, archaeology, from linguistics, from, from uh, numerous different sources, um, including DNA and genetics. Um, but that's not the only, the only route. So, you know, I think, I think probably the preponderance of evidence, the reason why I feel like that uh, maybe kind of going to the 60,000 foot level, <laughs> you know, is that, that the Heartland research has, has, uh, has uh, been so widely accepted throughout the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but also in many of the remnant groups and so forth and, and, uh, and restoration groups, is that, is that it, it actually um, has so many different, whether it's genetics or, you know, or any, almost any different way that you can go about looking at this from plants and animals, you know, that are mentioned in the Book of Mormon to, uh, you know, to, to climate and culture and, uh, and, and Hebrewisms and so forth. Um, the, uh, the, the Heartland research actually does extremely well in all of those different camps. And uh, the DNA is one aspect of that, but it's an important aspect of it. And, uh, and, and, and I, so I'm going to address this actually with John Delin. Um, he's uh, he said that he would have me on in December. <clears throat> I figured that that, it's that at some point in time there's going to be too much snow up in the uh, the canyon that we're building in. <laughs> we're going to have to stop building at some point in time. And so hopefully December will be uh, will be an opportunity to do that. So I, I'm planning on going into a lot more depth and detail mm -hmm. on the DNA side of that in that interview where we're going to, you know, directly address, uh, Simon and, and, uh, and, and so forth. So I think overall, um, you know, Simon's a, a very nice individual, you know, he's a nice guy. He's, uh, he's been a little bit, uh, harsh, I think a couple of times on me, but, uh, but you know, that's, that's, that's part of the nature of the game, you know, so you just, uh, you just deal with that. Um, and, uh, and, and I hope to be able to address the, um, his, his, uh, some of his different, uh, understandings. But in order to do so, Stephen, we've got to understand a little bit why I differ. You know, some people call this, you know, just, you know, kind of wild-eyed, uh, you know, crazy, whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we, don't, we don't accept the status quo, you know. Um, people have, have uh, you know, like uh, he, I think, I'm not sure if Thomas Murphy has, but I, I, I would imagine that probably Thomas has also 
considered that uh, that we are you know just young earth creationists <clears throat> and for most people who are in the academic field that kind of means that essentially we just blindly follow and uh and we don't we don't really think for ourselves you know i mean this this idea of you know an adam and eve and a worldwide flood and the creation of the world and so forth that these things are are um are you know that, that we just kind of blindly just accept what the scriptures say and uh, no matter what the science says you know the science says something completely different um i just want to let your audience know that uh, that that's not the case this is not a blind a blind understanding this is actually from deep uh, research and, uh, and and years and years of study and so forth involving science and it turns out and, and now, now i'll just got, i'm just going to be straight up with everybody and that is that uh well i, I always try to be that <laughs> so i don't have to you know make this exception <laughs> so but i i believe that uh, true science and true religion have to and always will be fully compatible. Would you agree with that? I, you know, I mean, that's that's a that's a legit root worldview that you yeah, have there. Sure. And I know many many people on my side that would make the same. Uh, yeah. Space so truth space. is truth, whether it's true in the in the scientific realm or if it's true in the, um, you know, in, in in religion and uh, or in the Book of Mormon or whatever. So. So this, and this this is where I probably differ from most, and that is that if there is a um a difference a different you know differentiation basically if there is a uh, uh not a correlation between science what we know from science and what we know from the true restored gospel based on the scriptures and our best understanding of that now i know that scriptures you know have the you know it's easy to misinterpret sometimes scripture and scripture can be reinterpreted in some ways, you know, but in uh, energetic ways. Uh, and and uh, but uh, but bottom line is is that um, that with me, if it's uh, if there is uh, <clears throat> if there's discrepancies between the scriptures and the uh, and the the science, one of them's wrong. And you're and you're, you're making in, in, in your worldview, you and you know, uh, is that you know scripture first. Yeah. You, yeah. you believe in the Bible, you believe in the Book of Mormon, yeah. uh, you take them literally, uh, you know, yeah. and so yeah. if the Bible said it or the Book of Mormon said it, uh, that's, that's it. That's, that's the truth. And the yeah. worldview that science, because you have this idea of scientism, where you have people that follow science exclusively and don't take into account supernatural religion, everything like that. And folks, just so you know, I'm, I, I, I'm literally here just to call balls and strikes. Um, I'm here to have Rod tell his side, his story. And what's important to him is he, he wants to respond to Simon and John. And of course, John's given him a platform, which I'm really glad he's able to do that. Um, but the important thing is that, you know, Rod Meldrum's worldview is very, very similar to many, many people that I know in my movement. Probably about 40 to 45% of Americans would fall into the young earth creationist camp. So this is not a fringe idea within, within the United States of America. It's actually very a mainstream in many ways, and it's very influential in our country. We have the Ark Encounter, uh, we have the Creation Museum, we have uh, other creation groups. And so this your, your movement, if you will, and I like to call the Heartlanders a movement within um, the, the restoration, um, advocates for a young earth creation which many millions and millions of evangelicals do that as well so i i find it interesting that you know maybe rod has something to offer to young earth creationists as well uh well, that, that's 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 one thing i think that we really can do um because yeah it, it's kind of like uh, I, I, I often uh, um related it to you're, you're playing soccer right and you're on a soccer field and uh, and, the, and and the entire field is is basically elevated towards their goal. <laughs> so if you're going to play on their field, um, it's going to be pretty hard for you to ever win a, win, win a score when the entire field is slanted in their direction. And uh, and so you have to basically get on a more level playing field. And that's kind of where maybe it'd be good for your listeners to uh, to know a little bit more of where we're coming from. Uh, when I when I identify as a young earth creationist, let me let me let me qualify that just a little bit, okay? <clears throat> um, and that, that is a, a, a statement from Joseph Smith um, that he said that matter cannot be created or destroyed. It's always existed. 
So the, the, the matter that the earth is made from and the material that the earth is made from is, you know, extremely old. Okay, um, we don't, you know, I, I don't think as many, many, uh, like I don't know any, any LDS people who believe in ex nihilo basically out of nothing, you know, that it just kind of created out of nothing, which is interesting because that's actually what the science believes. If you take a look at the real, the real deal there, they, uh, they actually say that everything came from nothing. And that's not just from, you know, a lot of people don't believe that, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, that the, the science actually says that, but maybe I could uh, share just for a second um, that, that idea um, with you. Let me, let me just find it real, real quick here. But the idea that everything came from nothing, where does that, where does that come from? Actually, there's this, this is kind of the, uh, let me open this up here just one second here. And while you're opening up that slide. So basically uh, <clears throat> like the big bang, <clears throat> do you believe that the big bang happened or, or would you say that's creation ex nihilo? That something came from nothing. Um, well, let, let me let me kind of go into this for just a second here, okay, and cool. I'll share this with you here. And uh, so let's see if you can see that now. Yep. Okay. So this is essentially the big picture of modern science. If you want to break it kind of down in that, and that is that humans uh, came from ape-like creatures, which that are you know. Or, or lower life forms, I should say, which came from still lower life forms like bacteria and so forth, which ultimately came from chemicals, which was the result of the Big Bang, which came from nothing. Now people go, no, wait a minute, Rod. Now, come on. Now, no, no, nobody is saying here in science that everything came from nothing. And uh, since I know that there's a lot of people who would scoff at that idea, I thought maybe I better back this one up. <laughs> okay, so... So this, this idea of the theory of relativity is where we really get the, uh, the ideas of chemicals from a big bang from nothing. But just in case anybody really questions me on this, uh, this is a book, uh, New York Times bestselling book by Lawrence Krauss. It's called The Universe from Nothing. Why there is something rather than nothing. So here's a book that actually talks about it. And in this book, it talks about right here, uh, quantum fluctuations. Let's see if you can see this. Let's see if I, there we go. Let's make that a little bit bigger so you can see it. <clears throat> it says quantum fluctuations lead to the creation of tiny universes out of nothing. A few of these reach a critical size, then expand in an inflationary manner, forming galaxy stars, and at least in one case, beings like us. Um, okay, so isn't this sort of ex nihilo? You know, I mean, this is kind of interesting, right? Mm -hmm. But that, but then, but then somebody might say, well, that, well, that guy, he's just kind of a, you know, he's he's not really the big guns, right? So let's go to the big guns. The, the guy who was the 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 the, uh, the scientist of the century, according to Time Magazine, <clears throat> Stephen Hawking, the, the the guy that was in the wheelchair mm -hmm. for a long time, and he wrote this book. It's kind of he called it. He, he, it's kind of like his uh, modus operandi. You know, his 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 uh, his, his biggest achievement was this book called the grand design right and uh and, and stephen hawking out notes so this is we're not talking about small potatoes here we're talking about uh probably the most uh well people have called him the most intelligent human being that ever lived right and uh and so this is this is from uh from the page in his book page 18 and i'll just make broke it up so you can see it a little bit better it says now he says we will describe how m theory may offer answers to the question of creation. According to M-theory, ours is not the only universe. Instead, M-theory predicts that a great many universes were created out of nothing. Their creation does not require the intervention of some supernatural being or God. Rather, these multiple universes arise naturally from physical law. And my question to, to you is, how do you have physical law when you don't have any physical? <laughs> okay. I mean, most, most uh, you know, uh, grade school kids understand that you don't get something from nothing. But yet here we are, we, we are told by the smartest being in the whole universe, apparently, from the scientific field, that, uh, that everything was created out of nothing. So people don't believe me when I tell them that the science says that we came out of nothing, but here it is. And then, uh, and then he goes on in the next, uh, in, in page 227 here, it says, because... Um, because gravity shapes space and time and allows space time to be locally stable but globally unstable on the scale of the entire universe the positive energy from the matter can be balanced by the negative gravitational energy and so there's no restriction on the creation of whole universes 
because there is a law like gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing in the manner described in chapter six, which I guess must be one heck of a chapter to explain how everything came from nothing. Since spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing, why the universe exists, why we exist, it is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. So, uh, so there we have uh, you know, uh, two examples of science basically saying um, things that are absolutely preposterous, and yet people buy it. Is, has science ever been wrong before? I think we all know of numerous examples of science being wrong. So how do we place our faith then in science when science is telling us that everything came from nothing, which is really no different than ex nihilo, that, you know, that, uh, that there was nothing and all of a sudden, you know, God just went, you know, I don't know, whatever he did, and all of a sudden there was the world. Well, let me ask you, you a know? quick question. Um, yeah. The pushback that would be we, given. We can, go, we can go back out of that screen here. Do you want to? Oh, okay. Want to Go back out of there. Let's see. I'm not sure how to uh, stop the share. There we go. There we go. Oh, oh okay. okay. So okay. some would say it's not the science that's wrong. It's the scientists that, that are wrong and that the scientific method is the tool that one uses to uh, come to conclusions. So for instance, the scientists would say, well, yeah, we were wrong about this and that, or the Piltdown man was a, was a, was a hoax. Uh -huh. but it was a scientific method that ultimately gave us the answer that yeah. led us to that area of truth. So how would you respond to that? Well, which scientific method are you going to use? Because there's at least a dozen different scientific methods that are mentioned in all kinds of different textbooks. We actually did a research on this and we found out that there's, there is no one accepted universally understood scientific method. They all have sort of similar steps, but many of them have you know, five or six steps. Some of them have four um there's that you know there's there's not agreement in that it's kind of like if you have uh in in the field of uh of accounting you know what if what if what if you had you know you know 12 different um ways of doing accounting i mean how well would accounting work overall but there isn't even a, even a standardized scientific method um the, i think the general idea though of the, of the scientific method is, is pretty consistent a, a, across all of those but you know but which comes, you know, first as far as that's concerned. So, you know, hypothesis, where, where is law? Many of the scientific methods aren't even looking anymore for scientific law. They only look for, um, you know, elegant hypotheses that, that, that try to explain things. And this is where one of the differences that with the research that I did with the universal model, with uh, the Dean Sessions and the universal model was basically to, to go back and question the very origins. Um, in fact, uh, many, well, probably, 10 or 12 years ago, uh, the, uh, the, you know, <clears throat> the, our, the uh, president of a church, basically, President Nelson, was at a uh, state conference up in uh, American Fork, Utah, and he said, I want to all you scientists in the room, he says, I want you to go back and look at the origins of your science. And Stephen, this is where one of the things that I think is really important, and that is that uh, we go back and take a look at wh where did these ideas that we that we have that are mainstream science where did many of them come from for example you know where did the idea that the earth is a big ball of molten magma where did that originate and it turns out that there was kind of three groups you know way back you know in the 1200s and so forth but you know that uh, there was the plutonus the vulcanus and the uh, and the um neptunus and those three groups were arguing as to what the nature of the earth is. What is the structure of the earth? What is it primarily made out of? And of course, the Vulcanists were saying, well, we think it's, you know, it's, we, we know that these are volcanoes and so forth. So we think that the earth is probably a big ball of molten magma and the volcanoes are letting this magma come out of it. And then the, uh, the, the, uh, the Neptunists were saying, no, we think that, it's, that, that the earth is a big, uh, big ball of water because look at the, the oceans. I mean, you know, the oceans are so, so vast and, you know, 70% of the earth's surface is, is, uh, is, is ocean. And then you had the Plutonists who said, well, no, we live on a rock, <laughs> you know, so it's some kind of a rock. It's, it's got to be some kind of solid, you know, thing. And so they were, uh, they were arguing, discussing, you know, their, their different points. And the, uh, and the, the, the uh, Vulcanists said, well, how do you explain volcanoes? And the, the uh, Neptunists and the Plutonists said, well, um, well, what it is, is that there's, there's coal in the earth and that coal spontaneously combusts 
And that spontaneous combustion of coal is actually what causes the heat that causes volcanoes to happen. Of course, that was shown to be not true. And so the volcanists won the day. And long story short is that that has continued on throughout all this time. Yet we have uh, NASA that actually accepts the fact, uh, well, I wouldn't say it's a fact, but the, but the understanding um, that several of the planets in our own solar system are essentially water planets. Now, Neptune, Saturn, the rings of Saturn, we know now they are, they are water ice and so forth. We know that uh, several of the moons of, uh, of, of uh, Jupiter are, are primarily water-based planets. And, uh, and we know that, uh, you know, just this is a simple thing, and that is that why are planets spherical in the first place? <laughs> so, and, and, and it's fascinating because, because it's important in yeah. your worldview. Why is it yeah. important that the, the, the center of our planet is water as opposed to molten lava? Well, it's not technically, you know, from, from the universal model, it's not, it's not technically just water. It's a, it's a okay. lot more nuanced than that and understanding um, basically that what, I mean, how do we even know what's, what's inside the earth? Well, we've never been able to drill that. The two deepest drill holes that have ever been bored is the Kola hole and the KTB hole in Germany and Russia, respectively. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they only went about a quarter of the way through the crust of the earth. <laughs> okay, so so we, we, obviously we've never been able to drill there or be there. So how do we know what we know about the interior of the earth? And it has to do with seismology, um, seismic tomography and so forth, which is basically seismometers all around the earth. Um, as an example, when, um, when the first hyd hydrogen bomb was detonated on, on the uh, um, Bikini Atoll, I think it was, mm -hmm. um, it caused seismometers all around the earth. The earth literally um, rang like a bell, they said, for f about five or six days. The, 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 the explosion was so huge, it blew an entire island off the surface of the planet, basically. And, and it caused such a, such a the, the impact from that caused waves to travel through the earth, binging back and forth in and around the earth for almost five or six days. The earth, you know, it, it, it caused all kinds of uh, things within the structure of the earth. So um, scientists understand that the earth is a liquid. They just think it's liquid rocks. But we question where did the energy come from to melt 8,000 miles of solid rock into a liquid? That takes a tremendous amount of energy. Where did all that energy come from? And if it, and if it started off as a big ball of molten magma, why are there oceans? Because the oceans would have been boiled off into space at you know three thousand plus degrees, which is what it takes to melt you know uh, basement rocks of the Earth. The, the foundational rocks of the Earth it has to be at least three thousand plus degrees to do that. There would be no oceans on the Earth. And they say, well, what happened was is that when the Earth finally started to cool down. Um, from, from who knows how this energy happened in the first place, but bottom line, when it started to cool down, then, they, then, then comets started to, to smash into the earth, and it was the comets that brought the water later on. Well, it's a nice theory, but, uh, but there, there's, there's no evidence for that, okay? And, and what we do know is that the, that the, the earth is a sphere, and, that is the, and a sphere is the natural shape that you get when you have a liquid in space. So, there are, there are, you know, like comets and asteroids. Asteroids are in all kinds of weird potato shapes and so forth. They're not round. They're not spherical. But planets are all spherical, and it's because they formed from a liquid. The only question is, is which liquid is it? Is it liquid rocks or is it liquid water? And water is the most ubiquitous substance in all of the, all, all of the known universe. I mean, no matter where they've looked in space throughout the universe, water is, the, the water molecule is the, is the, the, the signature that comes back from the light sources and, and, and spectrometry and so forth, um, that, that is, water is basically everywhere in the universe. There's no place that they've ever looked that doesn't have water. So just so, real quick, so the moon is yeah. a sphere, Mercury is a sphere. Do you believe that there's water at the core of those uh, bodies? Uh, but, but as far as the core of it, Okay, it basically it formed from that. Now, sometimes the water has been driven off. Like, for example, for many years, Mars was thought to be completely a dry planet. Now we know for a fact that it, has, it not only has water, it actually has ice on the poles, just like the Earth does. 
you know, there, there's been there's been water found um, on the on the on the surface of the moon, basically through uh, through new studies and so forth. So, so uh, are those you know, do they have water on the on the surfaces now? Well, of course, you know, most of those are pretty dry, right? But uh, but when it comes down to it, though, um, how did they form? Because rocks don't form in circles, <laughs> you know, in 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 a, in a sphere. Um, that, so that they had to be either a liquid rocks and then solidified, or they had to be water and then they re remain the you know, the uh, remain um, in a globe in, in a globe shape. What about gravity? When is I mean that when, once a body gets big enough, it, it creates its own form of gravity. So wouldn't wouldn't the gravity that also naturally cause a spherical thing, or does it require water? Well, if, 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 if even gravity, basically, I mean, we have gravity, but yet we still have mountains, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so so gravity isn't going to change solids as far as that's concerned. I mean, it, it, it will move the solids into, a, in other words, if you have an asteroid and it's a solid rock, gravity is not going to cause that rock to go spherical it's, if it's a solid rock. It, it has to be, um, you know, have the ability to change its shape. In other words, it has to have some amount of, of uh, consist. Uh, what, what is that? I'm, I'm trying to think of the word. Right. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, uh, you know, some kind of consistency. And I'll, but but as far as the the Earth being a water planet, we're not talking about just you know just a just a big ball of water. It's very sophisticated. The uh, we we uh, we know from seismic tomography, for example, um, that the Earth's uh, core may actually be a single solid crystal. Um, science says that that's, that crystal has to have a density that is basically equal to essentially um, iron and nickel, or a nickel iron combination. So, a, so a, an iron core of the earth essentially. And then outside of that, they believe is a, is a liquid uh, outer core. And then you have the mantle, which is about 80% of the actual mass of the earth. And you have these little teeny crusts on the, on the outside, which is about the thickness of a piece of paper on a basketball sized earth so that doesn't account to very much the, the, the crust of the earth well it turns out that they were able to actually find an anomalous area on that core of the earth and follow it and it turns out it was very interesting there's articles that came out that said that the core is actually rotating faster than the crusts are every 600 years the core will actually make a lap on the crust as far as the rotation now that's interesting but but what we're what we're saying is is that with uh, have you ever heard of uh, many most people have never heard of what they call double diamond anvil cell research, which is where they take two diamonds because they're, they're they're sufficiently hard to be able to handle the pressures that they're going to put under. They hollow a little bit of the of the, of the in, interior of the diamond out and they put materials in there, put the two diamonds together, and then they mash them with massive amounts of of, of pressure, and see what the material does on the inside. Most people are not familiar with the fact that water is very unique in the fact that it basically, it, it will, um, it, well, first off, water is one of the only substances that when you freeze it, it actually expands instead of contracts, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's why, you know, does that. And also water has a, a high coefficient of, uh, of, of volume change when you go from a, from a liquid state to a gaseous state at 1700 to one. So one, one gallon of water will turn into 1700 gallons of steam, which is what drives steam locomotives and other kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that they took the water research here, and I'll just make this really quickly and brief. But basically when they do the water research on this, they take the, uh, the double diamond anvil cell, put water in it, put it under massive amounts of pressure. It turns out that water has at least 13 phases that they call it. So it will, it will compact to a certain point and then it will actually literally kind of like if you start off like, let's see if you can see that, there we go, <laughs> there we go. So it's like the, the, this, this is the water molecule, kind of, the, the, the water crystalline structure, I should say. And then when it's kind of under certain compression, it, it, it'll, it'll, it'll go, and that's phase two, phase three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. By the time you get down to water ice phase 12, it is more dense than iron nickel and more stable at the temperatures and pressures that we believe are in the center of the earth, which, which basically means that there could be no iron nickel core of the earth at all. It could be a gigantic solid ice crystal that is under massive gravitational pressure, which actually is more dense than iron. But that's not something that an average person, I doubt that, uh, that, that somebody like a... Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> like Simon and so forth. Mm-hmm. That I, I don't think they've done any research based on this double diamond and bill sell stuff. Well, so now, of course, folks, this we're. Go- I, I told Rod, I said, you know, give give the presentation however you want it to go. Probably a lot of you weren't quite expecting it to go to what is at the core of the earth, but this is a foundational aspect to your worldview as well. Um, and, well, and, and it deals with the science part of the DNA. The science part of the DNA. And of course, Thomas Murphy is going to come on to talk about um, the anthropological aspects of the Heartland model um, in yeah. response to this video. If there's a geologist out there that would like to come on to maybe talk about you know, his perspective and give his views on what Rod is saying. That's great, because I'm not a geologist, but I, I want Rod to tell his story. And so we're going to continue. Can I, can I explain why this is important? Absolutely. <laughs> it's not just about water, but also yeah. it's about rocks mm-hmm. and the uh, and, and the, the most um, abundant mineral on the earth is basically quartz. OK, okay. And, uh, and, 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 and and quartz based rocks, in other words, where quartz is a primary constituent of the rock. Is the is what makes up the most of the the, uh, the the foundational rocks of the earth. So as a ge- as a geology, um, you know, standpoint, um, if you're going to understand how the earth formed, then you got to understand how quartz rocks form. And it turns out that that's actually uh, an interesting aspect. We my my colleagues and I, the Universal Model, were able to actually replicate. There's about 20 companies around the world that make quartz crystals for uh, for um, for electronics purposes basically quartz has an interesting property called piezoelectricity which is uh which is which is essentially if you take a piece of quartz let's, let's say this is that this glass is this is quartz if i if i take and squeeze that okay if it's quartz it will actually produce electricity and then we have things like piezoelectric starters on our barbecue grills and it's used in all kinds of electronics but the uh but the but it's part of the properties of quartz anyway so the the bottom line is is that uh, if if we're going to understand how the earth formed, we need to understand how quartz rocks form. It turns out that geology um, does not have all the answers when it comes out that it comes down to the the, uh, the formation of quartz, but technology does. <laughs> okay. um, there's about, like I said, about 20 something companies around the world that make quartz crystals. And how do we how do they do that? Well, it comes it went all the way back to World War II. Um, the United States was buying quartz crystals for crystal radio sets. You probably not sure, Stephen, how old you are, but I think you may be old enough to know about crystal radio sets. Not, not quite, but I've, I read about them. <laughs> it was kind of before my time too, but, you know, <laughs> but I've studied it anyway. And so, uh, so the long story short is that um, is that uh, these crystal radio sets were uh, were being used for communications, and uh, and and the and the United States got does not have a lot of really pure crystal, at least not at that time. They didn't know about a lot of it. So it's being imported, I think, from Argentina or Brazil or someplace down in South, in South America. And anyway, so they so they were importing this and then they cut us off right before World War II. And uh, which means basically no communications if we can't get more quartz. And so they, they had kind of like a mini Manhattan project where they, where they put a bunch of money and a bunch of scientists got together and and uh, and said, you know, we got to figure out how to make quartz crystals. And they and they ultimately they tried to take uh, rocks and, and melt them in every different kind of way and, and, and bring them back to a, a solid, you know, in numerous different fashions, you know, in different pressures and temperatures and so forth, and try to figure that out. Um, and it never worked. Um, they uh, every every time you take quartz and you heat it up and melt it, when it comes back into a, a solid, it turns into this. It turns into glass okay and glass does not have the piezoelectric properties even though both quartz and glass are are silicon dioxide basically um, materials anyway so the uh, the so what happened was is that they actually figured out that the only way to make actual quartz is to be it, the process has to be done in water and, um, and 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 we know what the recipe is and it's not a secret well, it was a secret. Actually, it was a, it was top secret for many years. It was considered a uh, you know a, a uh, it's a security thing. A security yeah. thing, yeah. I mean, because no, nobody else could could do that. We were the only ones. The United States was the only ones who could make quartz crystals in the laboratory that were identical to natural quartz crystals, and so we were using those instead. And the reason why this is important, as far as from uh, from from an anthropology standpoint, is because what are dinosaur bones made out of? Well, agate or chert, which are basically quartz-based rocks. So if you're going to understand how dinosaurs formed in the earth, 
then you have to understand how quartz rocks form. Are you talking about how dinosaur fossils formed? Yeah, dinosaur okay. fossils formed. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. how, why, why we have dinosaur fossils in the earth. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's one of the big reasons why people say, well, the earth is obviously billions of years old because I mean, look at these dinosaurs and they're not here today, but there actually are dinosaur, dinosaur animals that are still alive today. Like the colacanth fish basically off of India, uh, they found colacanth fishes in the, in the fossil record and those mm -hmm. fish still exist today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, there's 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 lots of different uh, insects and so forth that are that, that are basically the same. You know, turtles and so forth have been found. You know, some of them are really huge, but that but there's you know that there's 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 other fish fossils and so forth that still exist today that were in the fossil record. Anyway, so that brings us to um, the reason why this is important for anthropology because it's always assumed that because of uh, if you find bones of an animal and it's been fossilized or petrified. Uh, even petrified wood is the same kind of a, of a process. Um, it's assumed that that's between 60 to 80 million years ago that that process happened. But who was back there to see the process happen? I mean, what is the process? And it turns out that my colleagues and I are the first people to ever be able to actually take a piece of wood or piece of bone and using the hydrothermal system is what, what this is called uh, in the technological world. Um, actually take pieces of bone and pieces of wood and actually turn it into a rock. So it went from calcium carbonate into a quartz-based rock, like a agate or a chert, okay? And um, no one else has been able to ever do that before. So have you, submitted, you, have you submitted the results of this study to any peer-reviewed journals or where can we find out about this study you did? Um, well, okay, it's not, it's not a study, it was an experiment. The experiment, that did, yeah. That we actually performed. And yes, it's all in the universal model. And in any any university level laboratory that has you know has a couple hundred thousand dollars sitting around um, can easily can, can easily replicate these experiments. But it's not it's not that it's new though, Stephen. This is the mm -hmm. point. There's companies that do it all day long, every day, and that's how they make their living. They do this, but they don't make petrified wood and petrified uh, bone because they they. They want, they're trying to get as pure a crystal as they can. So they want to take all the impurities out. We just want to know how does God do it? <laughs> you know, okay. how does nature do it? Nature's not, na nature's not, uh, you know, you know, everything perfect in, in that situation. So, um, so yes, they can do that. But not only that, but I also have, uh, I, I met another guy in Tucson, Arizona, the Tucson Rock and Gem Show. He and his colleagues, they're not, uh, I, I don't know if they're any particular faith. I'm, I'm not sure if they're atheist or, or have faith at all. But, uh, but I was talking to a guy who is uh, in, in regard to dinosaur bones. I can, I can just tell you this though, Stephen, and, and that it does not take 60 to 80 million years for a dinosaur bone to turn into a rock. It happens in not thousands of, even you know, millions of years or even, you know, thousands of years or even a year or even a week or a month. It happens in hours when the conditions for it are correct. If you have the right recipe, um, it's kind of like I tell, I tell groups all over the, you know, all over the world, basically, you know, if, if you want to make a Mrs. Field cookie and I give you the, all the ingredients and give you the exact um, re recipe to, to make a Mrs. Field cookie, could you do it? And most people say, well, yeah, if I have the recipe and I have the exact stuff, I can, I can do that. And, and that's the same thing with this is once you understand the recipe, you understand how the rocks form and the rocks of the earth had to form out of water. When I say out of water, meaning precipitating out of solution. So it's not like they're just, you know, just, uh, just all of a sudden a rock appears. There's materials in the water that precipitate and that's what causes the, the quartz to happen anyway. I'm kind of getting off on a little bit of a tangent here, but 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 bottom line is to, to to understand where we're coming from as a as a faithful young earth creationist, if you want to call us that. Now, when we say young earth, we're not talking about you know you know 24 hours kind of thing. Okay. Okay. Um, we're talking about uh, in in the, in our scriptures, we have uh, the idea that Joseph Smith gave that uh, that um, one day to God is a thousand years to us on this earth. Mm -hmm. And that each each different uh, uh, you know planet has its own timing system essentially. There, you know, so in the same amount of time that it takes for God that lives on a particular 
planet, which we call it, which we would like, I would, I would call it a, a, a governing planet mm -hmm. that's from the, uh, from the Pearl of Great Price and so forth in our faith. Um, that if he lives on this governing planet, then the same amount of time it takes for his planet to rotate one time on its axis, which is by definition a day, our earth will have traveled around our sun a thousand times, which is a thousand years by definition. Okay, so that's, that's the, the time scale. So if that's the case, then uh, my personal belief system is, is that, uh, that the earth was first created spiritually. And that's again from, from Moses and Abraham and the, and the Pearl of Great Price. But then it was also created then just like in Genesis, um, physically. And that physical creation, when God says it was a day or, or a period, um, believe that that was about a thousand years each period. So that's uh, so that's about seven thousand years of creation, and it's been about six thousand years since then. Okay. So the Earth's materials, the rocks that the Earth is created from, could very well be billions of years old, maybe even longer. But the but the question is is when were those rocks formed into the Earth? And that's where we get now, now a lot of a lot of you know, uh, restoration uh, people and Latter Day Saints basically believe that the, that the reason why there's dinosaurs on the earth is because of the fact that, uh, um, well, not the fact, but be, they believe it because God basically used leftovers from a from previous planets. earth yeah. mm -hmm. and, that, and those dinosaurs were stuck in the rocks of that previous earth. And basically, mm -hmm. so when he put this earth together, um, those, those rocks were there. The only problem is, is that any scientist or geologist worth their salt can blow that one out of the water by saying, well, basically, all of the, if that was the case, then God would have had to take in a, a previous earth, take in the, 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 the plates from that particular earth, and then place them on this earth very specifically so that all of the fossils are on the top side of the, of, of the crust. Also, the, earth would, the, the previous earth would have had to have been about the same shape, shape and size as our earth because its curvature wouldn't match our earth if it was a different diameter, as an example. So that wouldn't even work. Um, so... So why is it that all of the, 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 the dinosaur fossils and so forth that we find on the earth are within 200 feet of the current surface of the earth? Two to 300 feet down is about as deep as they get. You go into the Grand Canyon, there's not dinosaur fossils down there. You know, there, there, there are, are you know, some, uh, some other things that have been found, but most of those don't have any fossils in it. In fact, there's hardly any fossils in the Grand Canyon except for the Coconino sandstone layer, which is up at the top. So why is it that all of the, the, uh, the, the fossil layers are on the surface of what is this earth? It doesn't make sense that this, was a, that this earth was a, uh, was a previously you know, occupied uh, or, or using, using leftovers from a previous earth. The dinosaurs were here on this earth, which is part of the reason why I think in the Bible it talks about behemoth, which has a tail like a cedar tree. I mean, what, what animal is that they're describing? You know, why is it dragons are mentioned in both the Bible and the Book of Mormon? Um, you know, there, there are animals and things that have been here. Um, and then this, and this is one of the other big factors that, uh, that geologists, um, in fact, we have a, a number of people who have been professional geologists their entire life. And after having read the universal model information, um, realize that their, their entire paradigm is based on a couple of assumptions that are non-tenable. There, there, there's, there's, there's no way to verify the interior of the earth being a big ball of molten magma. So they say, well, where did the magma come from? Well, it comes from friction. Every, every, every volcanic eruption that has ever happened, as far as we have been able to tell with, with scientific instrumentation, has been preceded by earthquakes. And not just a few, but earthquake swarms of earthquakes. The earthquakes cause the heat, which causes the water to expand, which causes pressure, which is causes the, the mountains to to become more pressurized, which causes more earthquakes, which causes more pressure, which causes more heat. And, uh, and, 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 and so we have a catastrophic, you know, a cataclysmic uh, expansion of this thing to the point where it can blow the tops off of mountains like Mount St. Helens and others. Anyway, so the why am I bringing all this stuff up? It has nothing to do with the heartland research, right? Well, it actually does because it addresses the, the core foundational principles upon which Simon and other scientists base their, their, um, their denial of the DNA because of primarily dating, right? Well, where does the dating come from? 
you know, when, when, they, when, they, when they talk about Kennewick Man, for example, with David Reed, and he talks about uh, Kennewick Man, well, where's the dating come from? The dating has been all over the, all over the board. Why is the dating on the DNA different? Why, how, how does, the, how does the, uh, the, the formation of the rocks and so forth of the earth, how does that play into this whole thing? Well, you have to have the foundation of the understanding and be able to, and willing to question the science. Science has been wrong numerous times. So why, why are we putting them up as the, as the standard upon which everything else must, uh, must accept the, the, the science when, uh, I'll just give you one quick example. Um, I've asked numerous geologists this question. If the, if, if, the, um, if the process of fossilization actually takes 60 to 80 million years as a minimum to turn a dinosaur into a rock, and by the way, um, uh, it's not just the bones of the dinosaurs that actually get preserved. There's actually been, even soft tissue has been preserved in, in, in dinosaur bones, in T-Rex bones up in Montana, for example. Um, we have, uh, we have um, so much, I mean, again, if we, had, if we had about a week to talk about this, Stephen, we could talk about this in more depth, but we don't. And so I'm, 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 trying to, I'm trying to give enough information so people can realize that it's not just a wild guess but actually is based on real science. And real science and real religion is 100% compatible, okay? But the bottom line is this, and that is that uh, if, with, with the experiments that my, myself and, uh, and my colleagues were involved with in, in creating petrified wood and petrified bone in a laboratory in a be between 48 and 56 hours, and then we have examples, for, for example, um, they have dinosaur brain tissue. We know exactly what a T-Rex's heart valve looks like because it was so perfectly preserved in the stone. Well, how does a heart valve that's only maybe a, a, an, eight, an eighth of an inch thick soft tissue, how does that remain even intact over millions of years while it slowly turns into a rock? Why do we have in, up in Michigan Petrified jellyfish, which don't even have a hard body part, <laughs> you know, they, they, these, these jellyfish are fully, you can see their, their entire body. And somehow, even though they don't have any bones, they were fully fossilized. Now, I, I was just mentioning this, uh, this other group um, that I met uh, at this Tucson Rock and Gem show. And uh, it was, I was there talking to this guy about dinosaur bones because he made, he made dinosaur bone knives. So he had these dinosaur bones and he had, you know, connected to it really, really uh, like, like, like $10,000 knives with this really expensive steel and so forth. Anyway, I was just talking to him about dinosaur bones and how we'd done that. This, this other guy was there and he overheard me and he says, so, um, so you're saying that you've been able to petrify bone? And I said, well, yeah. He says, well, what's your process? And, 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 well, and, I, and he said, well, that's, excuse me. He said, that's what I do. I said, what do you mean that's what you do? He says, yeah, we've, we've, we've been able to, to, uh, to fossilize things. I said, well, well, what's your process? And he says, well, what's your process? And I says, well, I asked you first. <laughs> so but he was with the University of Bristol. And, uh, and long story short is that he basically, by taking certain kinds of clay, clay mineral, they would take uh, like a, a little lizard and euthanize the lizard and then put it into this clay, put it into an autoclave about 2,500 pounds per square inch and about four or 500 degrees temperature. And in about five to six hours, he could pull out that piece of clay and then they'd have to take and, 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 and break it open just like you would like a, you know, fish, fish fossils and so forth. And here's that little, that little uh, lizard fully fossilized in the clay in about five or six hours. And they do, you know, uh, thermoluminescence uh, study and so forth on all these kind of different uh, tests that they can do on it. It's it's identical to modern day, you know, to, to natural fossils, but it only took five or six hours to do that. Now, are there still soft tissues in that lizard as a result of the process? Well, that's that, that's the thing that, that the heat causes the fats and everything to desiccate and actually, um, that, so it, it really what it is is it's like a two D imprint of the animal. So it's not full petrification. It's what, what we call we, we differentiate between petrification and fossilization. Fossilization is when you basically preserve the animal in material. Petrification is when you turn it into a rock. So this is kind of like, a, and I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I have, um, 
I have ones I could actually show you, but uh, but what, what I'm talking about, but they were able to do that in just a few minutes in a laboratory and they know the, the answer. They said, so what's your process? I said, well, our process is basically a little bit more pressure. They both have to be done in water. In other words, there, had to be, there has to be water in the system to make this work. But ours basically is at 13,000 pounds per square inch pressure at about 400 degrees Celsius, which is what, about 650 degrees um, Fahrenheit, I guess, somewhere close to that. So it's not really a lot more, we're not melting anything. But, they, but basically it has to be done in water in autoclaves. And, uh, and I can show you pictures of, of, of what happened there, but basically you know, we made the first ever man-made petrified wood. And Stephen, I'm telling you, it does not take millions of years. It happens in hours. And it's not a theoretical, whatever, any, any laboratory can do this. Other laboratories are already doing the process. They're just not putting wood in it because they don't wanna have all the lignin and the other, you know, the cellulose and so forth that goes along with it in their in their quartz crystals, uh, which is why they don't do that. They want pure crystals. So, right. so when I, when, I, when, I, when I say this, this this I, I guess my point here this morning is making this, and that is that this is not a a um, just accept it on faith about the creation about Noah's flood and so forth. This is a scientific based. Um, information that that actually is fully compatible with what we understand to be true from the gospel and from the creation accounts we have uh, in in the lds church we have the you know we have three creation accounts in the scriptures basically in genesis and abraham and in moses and then we also have uh in our temple you know the endowment ceremony also talks about creation so i think god wants us to understand something about creation <laughs> you know and, uh, and, and, and we don't have to, um, you know, people say well, we're anti-scientific. Actually, it's just the opposite. We are very pro-scientific, but we are anti-establishment science when the establishment science can be shown to be wrong. And let me give you the, the one quick example here. And that is that uh, if, if the process of fossilization is something that's supposed to take, you know, 60 to 80 million years for that to happen, then there should be in the fossil record all kinds of things that are in the process. In other words, things that there should be, set, we should find dinosaur bones that are like halfway petrified. You know, it's halfway through the process. Some, some stuff that's like 75% through the process and some stuff that's only 25% through the process. And then you have the, and then the stuff that's fully petrified, right? Where's all this stuff in the middle? Stephen, it doesn't exist. There, there is no... And there, and there should be a lot more of the stuff that's not quite petrified yet than there is the stuff that fully it is fully petrified because you know there's been more and more animals as, as as the population of animals has grown on the earth you should have a lot more animals that are being buried and so forth and and and, and being in the and getting started in the process right where's all the halfway petrified dinosaur bones where's all the halfway petrified you know stuff it it doesn't exist. It's not in the fossil record. It's not in the geology because it is not a process. Stephen, it's an event. Okay. Well, that's interesting. You know, uh, <laughs> so I, I have to say like one, I, I mean, I'm not a geologist, so I'm not an expert, but the, I, I think that one of the things they would say is that very few fossils, very few things are oh, fossilized. fossilized right. And so you're only going to find the fully fossilized animals. And 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 they and then they do say it's a relatively quick process because basically it has to be in an oxygen deprived environment very quickly for the preservation to happen. So it doesn't necessarily take sixty to eighty million years for the process to occur. It's just that those are the what they're saying. That's the age of that fossil, um, but it doesn't. It's not a million year process for the for the. Yeah, would but, you, but, but, but nobody's saying that there was fossils that were made. Now that there, there, now there is one exception to that, and that is at the bottom of oceanic trenches and hydrothermal vent systems, like the black smokers and the white smokers that you find with uh, with with uh, superheated water coming out at the bottom of the oceanic trenches, like the Marianas Trench. Mm -hmm. That is the only place where active fossilization is happening. Mm -hmm. Where does the pressure come from? Where does the thirteen thousand pounds per square inch pressure come from if you're on the surface of the Earth? Well, it turns out, Stephen, this is just just a, you know, a, a, a gee whiz moment here for a second, but it turns out that uh, 30,000 feet of water 
is at 13,000 pounds per square inch pressure at the bottom of that column of water. Mount Everest is 29,000 feet high. Every ancient history talks about a, a, a worldwide deluge, a worldwide flood, right? Whether it's the Pope Aldu or the Torah or the Quran or the Bible or, or even the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon actually doesn't specifically mention that, but it does say this. He says, after the floodwaters receded from off the face of this, con th this country, it became again a new country. Now, if you, if you understand that Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden were here in America, basically in the, the Missouri area, mm -hmm. um, then, uh, then they're, they're talking about the Noah's flood was over here. Uh, we believe, uh, my personal uh, understanding is, is that, that uh, Adam and Eve were placed here in the Garden of Eden, which was essentially around the Missouri area, according to Joseph Smith and others that, uh, that talked about that. Um, then when Adam's posterity became uh, fully ripened in iniquity, then the earth was cleansed. Um, Noah built the ark here in America. So I think it's kind of interesting that the ark encounter is basically in the same general region, <laughs> probably that the original ark was built. Right. <laughs> anyway, so, and, then, uh, and, then the, uh, and then it ended up over in the mountains of Ararat over in Turkey. And people say, well, and, and we have, unfortunately, we have apologetics uh, communities here in the LDS church that have tried to poo-poo the idea of the Noah's flood. In fact, uh, there was an article that came out about three or four years ago, written by one of the guys from Fair Mormon and so mm -hmm. forth, that talked about the five, five answers to hard questions about Noah's flood. And he talks about it being a myth. He said the Noah's flood myth. Now, now to be fair, he said, well, myth in the sense of, you know, that uh, this is a, a historical thing. But the fact that he calls it a myth to all the members of the church, that most members of the church would understand myth to be, it's a, it's a fairy tale it's a fantasy, mm -hmm. right? Um, and he says, well, there, there's no geological evidence for a, for a worldwide flood. So in the universal model, we, we not only give over 60 different evidences of a worldwide deluge, but things, things geologically speaking that would not be possible if it wasn't for flood events happening massive flood events happening but we also have a mechanism for the first time where how the how the noah's flood actually could have happened how do we get thirty thousand feet now it, it, it's a it's a poor assumption okay i'm going to say um mount everest was probably not even in existence at the time of noah's flood okay so with the, so the, the noah's flood didn't have to be thirty thousand feet but it would be easy to have a thirty thousand foot level of water everywhere around the earth if the Earth is a basically water planet, which NASA already accepts that, that many planets are, and that and, and many moons and so forth and other planets are water planets, water-based planets. So if that's the case, then all it would take is the Earth's rotation rate to slow down by just some small percentage, and the gravity of the Earth would pull the crust of the Earth towards the core, but the Earth is rotating, which means it has centrifugal force, so the heavy materials are being thrown out right? But, but gravity is trying to pull it in. So the crusts are in this equilibrium between these two primary forces, gravity and centrifugal force. And, and we know that centrifugal force is significant because the earth is actually about, what, 20 miles wider at the equator than it is from the North Pole to the South Pole. And in fact, some planets like Saturn are so, that there's so much centrifugal force on Saturn that actually you can see that the planet itself is not perfectly round. It actually is oblate. It's called oblateness. And it's oblate towards where the rings are at. The, the, the point basically being that, that, that the spinning of the planets actually causes the heavy material to be thrown to the outside. If you slow down the rotation rate of, the, of that planet, then gravity is not going to change, but the, the rotational energy is going to change. And that rotational energy is going to cause the crust of that planet to actually sink towards the center. And if, it, and if it's a liquid center and that liquid happens to be water, what's going to happen? The water is going to come on the outside of that crust. And 30,000 feet is a nothing burger when it comes down to an 8,000 mile wide earth. So, I mean, it was, you, you wouldn't be able to see it from space, any difference. So you're, you talk about you and your colleagues. Um, who, who's, who, what's the name of the individual that devised, came up with the idea of the universal model, if you don't mind? Uh, Dean Sessions. Okay. I, I talked to some of his people when I was out there last time um, and have had talked with them briefly. 
Um, have you guys taken this work that you've done and submitted it to like anybody at BYU or any geologist for any like peer review? I mean, what, what you get, you have this model, how, what's the process of you guys developing the model and then what kind of peer review uh, structure do you have? I know, you know, just, just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, interesting thing about peer review is that, uh, that it, it has both good and, and bad quality qualities. <laughs> okay. The, the, the one thing about peer review is that basically um, it helps you to not make dumb mistakes, you know, things because other people have expertise in many different fields and so forth. So, so if you have peers review your materials, okay, then, uh, then that can keep you from, from, you know, from making, you know, oh, I didn't realize that, or I didn't, you know, I, I, I forgot about this or whatever kind of thing. That's the original intent of peer review, but what peer review has become in the academic world is basically conformity, you know, if, if you if, if you try to, for example, if you try to get any funding from any of the three major scientific organizations that that uh, that, that that you know uh, they lobby Congress and they get the money, money from Congress basically you know from from the government comes through one of these three organizations for almost all scientific stuff. It's the, the NAS, the National Academy of Sciences, the, the AAAS, the American Association for the Academy for the Advancement of Science, and the NSF, which is I call the non-sufficient funds. No, excuse me, it's the, it's the National Science Foundation. <laughs> so, so the NSF, those three organizations channel all of the money that is that is that is earmarked for scientific research to all the universities and so forth, right? Now, I think there's there may be some new ones now that was that that was a number of years ago when we were doing this research, but by their own admission and their own surveys, they are 95 to 98 percent atheists that run those organizations. And if you think you're going to get funding for any kind of research that is going to challenge the status quo of these scientific organizations, you're up in the night. You're not going to get funding for that because they're not going to fund something that directly contradicts their their uh, their particular thing. So, uh, in answer to your question, is it peer reviewed? Um, I would say that uh, I'd, I'd have to say two things. Yes, it is because we have over fifteen thousand peer reviewed journal articles that we're directly quoting from in the universal model in the three volumes. Now, the third volume is not out yet, but the first two volumes are. And uh, so, in that sense, it's one hundred percent peer reviewed. But what we're taking is the data from the research. And applying a new understanding of the data, and this is where the difference has lies. Basically, you have data, and then you have interpretation of the data. Sometimes it's hard to distinguish, distinguish or differentiate between those two, right? Um, but when you take the actual data, the ob observations that have been made, um, and then you apply it to the new paradigm, it's absolutely stunning how well the data fits the new ideas of the universal model. And the only the re, main, main reason why I'm bringing up the universal model stuff is because um, when it comes down to the heartland research, I was doing the universal model stuff first, and that led me to, to have a healthy um, questioning mind about science. What does science really know? I mean, what do we really know about? Uh, did we come from apes and slime? I, I, I don't believe that from the standpoint of the scriptures. But now I can I can tell you that uh, from a DNA standpoint, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, are, are we are we closely related to chimps? Yes, we are. We're also closely related to frogs, and other and other animals. God has a uh, has a way of, uh, of of doing his the, the DNA, and he uses the same building blocks, the building systems, and so forth for all the different kinds of life forms that there are, are in the earth. And so similarities just... does not necessarily make us. Uh, descendants from them it's basically I, I believe it shows god's hand in using the same kind of building blocks and creating other you know all kinds of different animals and and, and we could go into evolution mm -hmm. you know i'm a i'm a uh, i'm a firm believer that there is a truth of evolution and then there's the the, the lie of evolution the falsehood of evolution now i can tell you that uh, that simon southerton and thomas murphy and so forth all of these guys are 100 on the evolutionary train they believe in evolution fully and completely that we came from lower life forms. I will tell you uh, right up front that, that not only do I not believe it, but we have the evidence to show that that did not happen. And if you want to know more about that, that's in book two of the universal model. If you come to that understanding, then all of a sudden the Hartman research and the DNA starts to make more sense. 
and we start to understand how the dating of the DNA happens. And that's, and that's the primary thing that I'm going to be discussing then when we get with, uh, with John DeLynn uh, yeah. on Mormon yeah. stories here in December. So, you know, we, we're running <laughs> short on time, but I'm gonna, I want you to give like a brief uh, elevator pitch to a young earth creationist telling them, listen, we have ha Halio Group X DNA in the upper Midwest of the United States. And within the time scale of a young earth creationist, they would have to acknowledge that, that that issue that they would have with their model. And what you're proposing basically with the Heartland model is that we have the solution to that, that if you are somebody who believes in the young earth creationism and you want to know how that X group got there, we actually have a book that tells you how that happened. Yeah. In fact, I, I, I maybe share with you just a couple more uh, yeah. quick, uh, quick slides here about this. Um, uh, let me see here. Um, let me let me just pull this up and share with you just a couple more things here. Yeah, let's do that. And while we're talking, you know, I just want to let the audience know that um, I have talked to David Reed. Um, he might be coming on soon to do a Face of a Nephite. Um, that was discussed extensively in the John DeLynn interview. He's also been CCing me uh, his correspondence with John DeLynn. So I'm aware of what's going on with that whole conversation as well. And Rod has his screen up. Okay. Okay. So this is from the Israel Central Bureau of Statistics. The Druze are people that reside primarily in Syria, Lebanon, Israel, with a smaller community in Jordan. The Israeli Druze are mostly from Galilee and around Haifa, and the Golan Heights, region controlled by Israel but claimed by Syria. It's home of about 20,000 Druze. The interesting thing about that um, is these, these Druze people have this haplogroup X DNA type. Now, the haplogroup X could be subdivided into two subgroups called haplogroup A and, or, yeah, excuse me, haplogroup X, X, A, and X, B, basically, or X, excuse me, X1 and X2. Anyway, so this is, but this is Donald Yates. Um, he is the founder and principal investigator of DNA testing systems out of Tempe, Arizona. He's a Native American, and he also has seen the same situation going on with the DNA stuff. He says, uh, finally, the mystery of haplogroup X was revealed in a very important study by a team under Dr. Schlitz. Under, he determined without any doubt that the origin of haplogroup X was the hills of Galilee in Israel. That was the origin of haplogroup X DNA type as the hills of, of, of Galilee. This is from uh, Evolution and Anthropology, Worldwide Distribution of Haplogroup X Frequencies. You can see it's in the Ojibwe over here in, in, the, uh, in America and the Orkneys and the Druze populations of, of, uh, of Europe and, uh, and Israel. Um, this is the, 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 uh, the haplogroup X DNA over in this is the the uh, the areas where it's the highest frequency, okay, and uh, and, and you can see it's been in the Mediterranean area there in Israel and throughout Europe. The haplogroup X DNA is found, but it's also found in the northeastern part of the United States, okay, and uh, and, and up into Canada, okay. So this is the distribution around the world of this. Uh, so this would actually lend support, I believe, for the Book of Mormon. But again, it's going to come down to the dating part. Uh, the fact that they're both haplogroup X, and it can be argued, I think Hugo Prego would even have, would argue that as well. By the way, Hugo Prego is also a, uh, a, a, is a big believer in that we came from lower life forms and we did not necessarily come from an Adam and Eve, although I think he would probably argue that, well, at some point, human-like animals were finally got to the point where then God basically just took one of them that had evolved and said, okay, now you are Adam and you are Eve and, and, and then and that and so forth. I think that's kind of how he kind of feels about it. I personally believe that we were placed here on the earth as humans in the likeness of God. Okay, so that's basically my my belief on this. Um, this haplogroup R. Now the, the X DNA is a mitochondrial DNA um, lineage. Then the haplogroup R is a Y chromosomal, the, the male side. And again, you can see that it basically follows the same pattern here of uh, northeastern America and throughout Europe, okay? And then this is when, this, this is from uh, PLS-1, this is the, back in 2008, the Druze is a population genetic refugium, talking about how these, the, these, uh, these Druze, because they don't intermarry with outside people, they became a, a, an isolated population that provides a sample snapshot of the genetic landscape of the Near East prior to the modern age. Uh, this is the American Journal of Human Genetics in 2002. The re, uh, greatly reduced mitochondrial DNA diversity in the Jewish populations showed that there was an inward gene flow from the host populations must have been very limited. In other words, they, they, Jews don't tend to intermarry with outsiders. 
So because of that, their, their, their population has remained pretty isolated over the course of time. And these are from, this is uh, BMC Genomics in 2008. Um, total of 1,179 uh, type 2 diabetes patients were, uh, were, were uh, shown the Jewish populations. And they, and they mentioned the 12 most prevalent mitochondrial DNA haplogroups in Ashkenazi Jews. Who are the Ashkenazi Jews? They're the most, uh, um, well, the, the largest Jewish population on the planet is the Ashkenazi Jews. And there, there we have uh, the, all the different haplogroups, the 12 different most prevalent mitochondrial DNA haplogroups in these uh, in the Ashkenazi Jews and X, haplogroup X is one of those, as you can see in this, in this uh, thing here. So the Ashkenazi Jews, Iraqi, Libyan, Moroccan, Jewish populations, they all have the haplogroup X DNA type, okay? Now the Iraqi Jews, they, they, they are real interesting, okay? The Iraqi Jews are Jews who were born or whose parents or grandparents were born in Iraq, but Jewish tradition places the origin of this community in the exile following the destruction of the first temple in 586 BC. So after Lehi in the Book of Mormon, after he leaves 600 BC, just a few years after that, about 14 years after that, you have the Babylonians came up and, and, and uh, took over the southern tribes of Israel, right? And uh, so the southern tribes of Israel, they basically are hauled back to Babylon as slaves, which is today Iraq. So they sequenced 41 individuals, or I think it's 43 individuals from this Iraqi Jewish population. Guess what, Stephen? This is the American Journal of Human uh, Genetics. They found that, the, uh, that these Iraqi Jews, they have the haplogroup X DNA type, which tells you now that you have National Geographic. Now, is National Geographic a, 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 a well-accepted scientific um, publication? Well, I think so. And it says, great surprise, Native Americans have West Eurasian origins. West Eurasian, where, where's West Eurasia? In the article, it says nearly one third of Native American genes come from West Eurasian people linked to the Middle East, i.e. Israel and Europe, rather than entirely from East Asians as previously thought according to a newly sequenced genome. This is in 2013. Okay, now this is where it gets really interesting. This is uh, American Journal of Human Genetics. Okay, um, they said that, they, that based on this, the haplogroup X DNA sometime, probably arrived sometime between 17,000 and 30,000 years before present um, was when they think that when it arrived. Well, obviously that would be well before Lehi's time frame. That was the original one. So about 30, up, up to 30,000 years ago is when haplogroup X arrived here in America, okay? Now I'm gonna get into this in more detail with, uh, with, 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 um, with John, yeah. with John. But, uh, but anyway, so this, this is uh, from Nature, clear back in 1987 that uh, all mitochondrial DNA stem from one woman postulated to have lived about 200,000 years ago in Africa. This is the, uh, the, the pseudo theory, we, we call it basically the out of Africa, that everything came out of Africa. Why do they think that it came out of Africa? Because they think, and this is, this is gonna be very racist because it is, okay? Um, the reason why they think that everything started in Africa is because apes and chimps are black. Blacks came from Africa, so, as, as people evolved further and further away from the apes, they became more and more light-skinned. And, 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 and that's part of the reason why you know, the black people were thought to not be human. You know, they, were, they were kind of a, a subhuman species and people with darker skins were thought to be that. That, came, that continued on clear up until the, in the 1800s when people thought that if you have a darker skin, you weren't as evolved as the people with whiter skin because we all started from apes, which were black. You see how racist that is? It's crazy and it's, not, and it's not true, but that's what the origins of the science is, is that we all started off as black apes and then, and then the more we evolved towards, uh, you know, you know to, to become more uh, elevated or whatever you want to call it, that we got lighter and lighter skin, which is complete baloney. But, uh, but nevertheless, that's, the, that's the, the, the general belief there. And this is where it comes down to genetics. This is in, in 2006. They said, assuming, now when you assume, you, you know what happens, right? <laughs> I've heard the term, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Okay, assuming six million years for the human chimp species split and six and a half million years for the most recent common ancestor, the mitochondrial DNA lineages, we estimated the average transversion rate at synonymous and RNA, R RNA positions. And all, over all genes and mitochondrial DNA, this would have, this would have, it, it, would have 
a equivalent to an accumulation of one synonymous transition or mutation every 6,764 years on average. They're saying that an average mutation rate of the mitochondrial DNA, that one mutation happens every 6,764 years. Um, but that's based on the assumption that we split from the apes 6 million years ago. What if that assumption is wrong? What if that's a bad assumption? And it turns out that when they actually do pedigree studies, this is like, like this is the American Journal of Human Genetics. They said that the direct estimation of mitochondrial DNA mutation rates simply by counting the number of mutation events observed in pedigrees. This is the difference between the, the dating here, okay? Um, and, and again, I'm going to get into this with uh, with John, so I don't want to I don't want to uh, take up the time to do this, but I'm just going to I'll just I'll just back out of the screen here. Let me just just say that uh, that this understanding is not based on a blind belief that the scriptures are true. It is based on the underlying understanding that the scriptures are true, and then going out and and uh, and looking at the data to see where the data leads. Now, this is not just, uh, I, I will say this, that it's not scientific in the sense that, you know, from a purely scientific standpoint, you would expect to just follow the data wherever it leads. The problem with that idea is, is that data can be interpreted in many different ways. You know, just like an accident happens and, 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 and four people see the accident happen, the accident is the data, it's what actually happened, but four different people saw it and you have four different understandings of what happened. Well, this guy didn't stop. Well, this guy hit, hit the gas. Well, this guy did this. Well, this guy swerved and this guy didn't swerve or whatever. Everybody has their different understanding of the data. The data didn't change. The accident is what it is, but everybody looked at the accident differently. Okay, in the same sense, the data in science is the data, but you can look at it from lots of different viewpoints. And that's what we're saying is, is that you don't have to look at it through the lens of the atheist, atheistic uh, scientists who run the three organizations that, that uh, basically fund everything in science, you can actually look at it from a standpoint of faith. And looking at it from the standpoint of faith, Stephen, I'm telling you what, it is exciting because it mashes. The data actually fits much better, the universal model understanding of what we're talking about. And it, what, what, what I find is fascinating is that when you have the admission of Simon Southerton and, uh, and, and John and other people who, who dismiss and actually almost mock and laugh at the universal model research. And both of them admitted that they've never even read it. You know, I mean, I thought, I thought Simon's, uh, Simon's um, explanation as to why he hasn't read it because, well, it's just too much stuff and it's, you know- Going what, down the rabbit remember. hole and all that kind of and, stuff. And, and so forth. If, you, know, you know, you just try to get so much stuff that, you know, that nobody can respond to it and so forth. Well, yeah, because when you're changing all of science, when you're, when you're challenging the very foundations of, of, upon which science has been built, it is going to change everything. So I, I would hope to and encourage Simon to, uh, to get a hold of a copy of the universal model, like many other you know, thousands of people have. And, uh, and, and if you have a tendency to believe the scriptures, are real and and, uh, and and are accurate, and that is whether you're LDS or whether you're uh, you know any Christian religion, any Christian denomination. If you're if you're Muslim, it doesn't matter. Every one of these of these religions have a foundation of creation, and uh, and 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 we can and we can give you the scientific evidence behind that that will that will encourage and and uh, and cause people to go oh my gosh this is so awesome and it's based on like i said i mean the, the, i'm not quoting here some some rinky dink journals these are mainstream scientific journals now is the universal model um, peer reviewed and the answer is yes there's over 60 different people who are in these different fields who have reviewed it okay is it peer reviewed in the scientific journals? And the answer to that is no, because we're using the scientific journals direct quotes. We don't need to get peer reviewed for their own quotes. So are those the 60 people that peer reviewed, do you have that listed of the, the, their names and, and, and stuff? The, so each each can different look that section up? of the universal model, we've, we've, we've uh, actually had different people from those different fields that have, have, have looked over it and so forth. Um, is it published? No. There's no, there's no published stuff. You, you're going to have to take it, uh, you know, if you want to go back to, that's the reason why we go back to the original source materials. This is where the sources come from. And you can look up the sources yourself. 
but it, but it's not a, a, a lazy man's organization. You know, it, it's not going to happen. You know, mm. it, 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 it took me probably four or five years to actually come to the understanding that science could be wrong. I mean, how could hundreds of billions of dollars have been spent and, and tens of thousands of, of scientists, how could they all be wrong? And yet it, it's because we are, we are starting with an origin that happened clear back in the 12 and 13 and 1400s and has been perpetuated and, and, and we just keep trying to make that, that fit, but sometimes it takes a scientific revolution. And, uh, and, 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 and if, you, if you read about it, if you've studied scientific revolutions, we know that that basically, at first it's basically just mocked and denied and so forth. For first it's just ignored. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, and then when, when a certain number of people get on board and say, well, well, this has some legitimacy to it, then it's basically mocked and it's violently attacked and then after it, uh, after it, it, uh, it, it uh, handles the attacks and has shown that it can actually you know, deal with a lot of these different things, then it's accepted and embraced and it, as if it was always the case. So This is how scientific revolutions happen, and we're about to have one. Okay, well, this is really interesting, folks. You know, one of the reasons I wanted to have Rod on and is I've been following um, his movement for quite a while online, um, watching on YouTube, and just trying to get an understanding. And actually, it was very helpful when you did a, a series last year regarding the Book of Mormon, and you had various guests come on, including Jonathan Neville, who that's how I found out about him. I was aware of his book, Moroni is America, and then I reviewed yeah. the book and had him on my program. Um, and I thought, okay, there's something going on here. And then basically, I think the turning point for your movement happened when you showed up on John Dillon's radar. And now they're, they were mocking you, and now they're saying, we got to now take you seriously. And, well, they need to address. It, it was the same thing in the, in the LDS uh, apologetics field. I mean, you have yeah. Fair Mormon and, uh, and, and uh, you know, Book of Mormon Central and so forth. They've all, been, they've, they've all been pushing this idea that the Book of Mormon happened down in uh, Guatemala and yeah. Central America for numerous years. And then, and then I came along and kind of said, well, you know, the problem is, is that the church keeps getting kicked in the teeth over and over again because there's the evidence is so weak and so flimsy, and 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 in many cases there is no evidence. And they keep saying, well, but you know, eventually, you know, the the the, the, the lack of evidence doesn't mean that there's no evidence. It means that we haven't found it yet. Well, you can use that excuse, you know, for a certain number of times, but after a while, you have to realize, no, maybe there's no evidence because there's no evidence. <laughs> So, you know, and this is the other the thing that's so fascinating to me, and I've discussed this with Jonathan, is that, you know, I look at the reception history of the document. What did the first people who read the Book of Mormon, what was their worldview? And then what was the Book of Mormon saying? And I tell people, said, when Brigham Young and Sidney Rigdon got their copies of the Book of Mormon, they read it, and then they saw the Indian mounds, they said, this is a history of those people. That was, yeah. That's what the initial audience thought of. Uh, that was their worldview, essentially. Now, as time progressed, things developed. But I tell people, if you if you reround the tape and you could replay the history of the church or maybe an alternate alternative universe, <laughs> instead of Brigham Young having f people, uh, archaeologists out in Mesoamerica uh, doing studies, they could have easily gone a different direction and BYU could be doing studies in the heartland. It was, uh, you know, it, it, doing archaeological work out there. It, it wasn't, uh, it could have gone either one direction. Now, right over the course of the 20th century, the Mesoamerican model has become the predominant narrative. Um, not but, any longer. Well, what's that? Not anymore. Well, I mean, it, at, least, at least not in the, in, in the America LDS church. I mean, yeah, it seems least. like, well, that's why, that's why your movement's significant. You know, I yeah. call you guys a movement. And I think it's something that more and more people uh, are starting to look at. I even had somebody from Fair Mormon uh, used to be with Fair Mormon say, you know, we, we really despise those guys. We did not like the Heartlanders. And well, uh, well they thought they, 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 they really see th this is the this is the, as I see it part of the problem because you know, I mean, part of the reason for apologetics is so that you can you know show answers to people's questions, and uh, and and the answers that were coming from the apologetics communities were more um, were being more faithful to their to their belief in the science than they were in their belief in the in the in the, in the scriptures. I, I give you a quick example. You know, one of the reasons why they say like uh, you know Hugo Prego and so forth have said, well, well, you know, there, there, there's there's no evidence for or against the Book of Mormon as far as from a DNA standpoint. And the reason for that is because when Lehi landed in Central America, 
they immediately assimilated into a larger population, you know, the Mayans that were already there. And, uh, and, and, and when that kind of thing happens, they can be diluted out of existence, which has actually been shown to be the case. It's possible with Icelandic studies and so forth that have been done, where you have a few people come into a, another population within a few generations, they, their DNA doesn't really show up anymore in the, uh, in the, in the more basic tests, you know, DNA tests. Um, but the problem is, is that that's not faithful to the Book of Mormon story itself. You know, when Lehi landed and, uh, and, and Nephi and those left, um, they didn't have to fight their way into the land of Nephi. They made Nephi their king, which doesn't make any much sense. If you have 50 or 60 people that show up in a population of 20,000, why would they make these, in, these incoming people their, their leaders, their rulers? You know, and, and especially since they have these kind of odd little uh, Hebrew uh, features, you know, like, you know, like circumcision. Yeah, I mean, okay. All you, all you guys from the from the new from the new you know the population are us newcomers are coming in and all you men line up for mm -hmm. your circumcisions you yep. know that's probably not going to go over that well yep. <laughs> you know, so yeah you know so it, so, it, 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 does, it doesn't make sense there's nobody else mentioned in the book of mormon that they uh, that they were fighting off and yet they but that's 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 foundational to the idea that their dna got diluted out of existence in another population so i know that you are running a little late and so i don't yes. want to take too much yep. more of your time okay. i do appreciate you coming on um you know I, I just want everybody to know that thomas murphy is going to be coming on he's going to be watching this video and i have a feeling while he's watching the video if he hasn't he's going to order the universal model volumes because <laughs> he reads everything and yeah. uh and so well, it, it, will, it will take him um a long time i mean he's, he's, I, don't, I don't have one here with me by the way the reason why i have a blank background is because we've been selling our house and yeah, you have to you know house. you have to stage it you have to take everything out and act like nobody's living here yeah so i've taken all my bookshelves and all the other stuff i mean they're all in trailers and in storage things and that's just it's, it's it's just a disaster and, and we've, <laughs> so we've been wanting to talk for months but this whole yeah. move has been i mean you you were yeah. supposed to pour your concrete months of weeks ago and you're still just did that yeah, well, we just did we just did uh you know 70 yards of concrete here just you know like two days ago but but, but anyway, so uh, so it's been very busy. But yeah. um, there was something else that you just said that, that reminded me to mention before we end. Uh, we that talked about Thomas sense. Murphy, Universal Model Books, um, and <sighs> he's going to be responding to uh, this video. Um, uh, yeah. Let's, let's, uh... And uh, so yeah. Well, anyway, but you know, we'll, we'll, you can we'll, come we'll back we'll on another time. And but, you know, uh, I do want to have you come back on, and because I also want you to share your your testimony. Oh, you remembered now what you wanted to say? Well, yeah, basically the universal model. If, uh, so so uh, for, for Thomas Murphy, mm -hmm. uh, by the way, I met his mom. She was at one of our conferences a few, uh, a couple of years ago, and she's just a really sweet lady. And uh, and I understand that, that, that I, I've never had the opportunity of meeting Thomas. I, I'm looking forward to that uh, opportunity someday, maybe sit down and have some dinner or something together. Yeah, he's a good but, dude. Uh, but, but I think that... Um, some of these guys like uh like 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 simon and and uh, john and, and thomas and so forth um grew up with the gospel in their lives and then i think that they to some extent they feel like they were they have been uh that the rug pulled out from underneath them when when the truth comes out about or, or when they find out more about science or whatever and uh and it doesn't match up with what was being told in you know by the in the scriptures and the prophets and so forth and so they feel uh a, a sense of uh, of um you know what i, I was duped but uh, i hope that they will look at this and especially with the universal model understanding um as they as they look at this now it, it's not going to be an easy read thomas i'm kind of telling you i mean each each volume is over 800 pages um it's almost 2400 pages total with the, between the three volumes the third volume is not out yet but if you read the first volume and the second volumes uh, I think um, almost every uh, geologist of faith that, I, that has actually taken the time to read these books, um, it, it is a complete and utter paradigm changer. It literally changes everything when you understand that the, uh, the structure of the earth is different than what we've all been taught and told in, our, in all of our books and our science books for all of our lives. If that's different, and it, it reminds me, of, and, and I'll kind of close with this here, Stephen, and that okay. is that uh, there was there was a dream that was talked about in the beginning part of the Book of Mormon that Lehi had of the Tree of Life, 
And in that dream, there was a great and spacious building. What was the foundation of that great and spacious building? Nothing. It stood, as it were, in the air. There were, as, as I kind of visualize this, there were tens of thousands, even millions of people in this magnificent, beautiful building, but it wasn't even real because real buildings don't float in the air. It's, it's not even connected to reality. It's like a hologram and all these people are on this massive building in this big, huge hologram and they're laughing and mocking and pointing at those who have partaken of the fruit. And basically, um, you know, saying, you know, what idiots are they? And then looking back from the tree at the great and spacious building and going, you're standing in a building that doesn't even have a foundation. What is that? What was that building representing? And if you can understand that all of this science has been built on assumptions that came from back in the 12 and 13 and 14 hundreds and that has and 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 has been built up to this massive idea. Now you know, people go, well, wait a minute, but we have all these technologies and so forth. Yes, we, we do have technologies, but the foundations that all these that the that the science is based based on um, is is stuff that we didn't even have seismometers at the time. We didn't have ways of looking at the earth through satellites and GPS. We didn't have uh, so many technologies that have given us the opportunity to study the earth like never before. And, uh, and yet we're still trying to hold to those old paradigms. It's time to get rid of the old paradigms. Actually, what it's time to is go back to the original paradigms that everybody in, in humanity and human history knew long before science kind of taken, has uh, taken its toll on faith. Everybody knew that there was an Adam and Eve. Everybody knew that there was a Garden of Eden. Everybody knew that there was a, uh, that there was a, a global massive flood, right? And then it was not until, you know, later on that the that, that science came in and started to, to uh, cause people to question those belief systems. But every ancient history talks about this stuff. So let's go back to the origins. Let's go back to the original understandings. Um, I am, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going on record right here and right now, basically, as a, uh, as a, uh, I, I, when I say young earth creationist, that, that there's some caveats to that, but I think in general, um, the earth is, uh, is, is the materials that make up the earth are billions of years old, but the earth itself, when it was actually formed, was only done maybe 13, 14,000 years ago. And uh, we have the evidences to show that we can show how dinosaurs formed in just, in just hours and how that was a massive event, that event that caused the dinosaur formation to, you know, to be, uh, to be uh, petrified was, the, was the, the only explanation for that is a worldwide deluge, a flood of, of uh, worldwide proportions that causes that caused, uh, fossils to appear on every continent of the earth. Anyway. Well, well Rod. There you go. <laughs> okay, well, I want to thank you so much for coming on. I'd like to have you back on one day to tell your story. I think you have a really interesting testimony that I'd like my audience to hear one day. Um, we discussed sure. it briefly when I uh, met you at the Firm Foundation Conference and uh, told you that I just felt like a kinship with you. Um, I, it's a personal thing that I feel for you. I, 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 when I say I'm a fan, I just, I'm a fan of you, Rod, and, and just the kind of person that you are. Oh. But I, I, I'm a fan of your faith, too. I mean, you're I, I a man tell, of faith. I think people never, never follow a person. No, no, follow, no. follow the truth, man. Follow the, right. pe people are, are fallible. People right. make stupid mistakes. They do stupid, dumb things, and including myself. Um, so, so let's, let's, let's find the truth. Let's and find let's the have, truth together. And let's have a conversation, a civil conversation together. You and John Dillon got on the phone together. I'd like for you to have dinner with Thomas Murphy, because I, 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 there's, I just love that man. I think it's just time that we start talking. And I think that's what the Savior would want us to do. And yeah. just remember, we're all created in his image. We are all image bearers. And we need to remind ourselves of that. We all bear his image. And if we can look at each other that way, I think we can have better understanding. So, Rod, thank you so much for coming on to my program. Thank you. I love you, man. Love you too, brother. Hang, hang in there. I, I, I've got to take off. But uh, Okay, so but, everybody, uh, like and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the notification button to be informed when the new video is out. Thanks again for coming, Rod, and you get out to that Christmas show. Yes. All right. Take care.